it is a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing one of my buddies from, gosh, probably 30 years ago, Danny Bobro, who's got a double MBA in finance and marketing. He goes by Danny. Danny is a um, Daniel A. Bobro, MBA, finance, MBA marketing, is CEO of American Dental Corporation. He's also executive director of Climb for a Cause and the Smile Tree. And the 888-NOW-SMILE, www.88nowsmile.com, patient referral portal. Danny's been published in Dental Economics, Dental Products Report, Dental Town, Dental Compare, Dentistry Today, and many other professional-related publications. He's also a certified mediator and arbitrator, personal trainer, health and nutrition coach, and member of the National Ski Patrol and International Mountain Bike Association. He served pro bono for several agencies, including the Better Business Bureau, Youth Justice Institute, Center for Conflict Resolution, Illinois Department of Human Rights, the Circuit Court System of the City of Chicago, and Loyola University School of Law. He also served on the board of the National Association for the Mentally Ill, Illinois chapter. He is an advanced communicator and advanced leader of Toastmasters International. Danny was a visiting professor for the practice management curriculum under Dr. Charles Wilson for Northwestern University Dental School from 95 to 97 and contributed to the practice management curriculum for Temple University, Maurice H. Kornberg School of Dentistry under Merwin Landate in 1998. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Economics from the University of Illinois and Master's of Business Administration degrees in Finance and Marketing from the University of Chicago and the Catholic University 11 from Belgium, respectively, and received various certifications ranging from insurance to wilderness first aid. Danny is a member of the American Academy of Private Physicians, the Academy of General Dentistry, American Academy of Dental Practice Administration, the charter member of the Speaking Consulting Network, SCN. He is also founding treasurer and executive committee chair of the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. He is creator, along with Bill Blatchford, the Art of First Impression Telephone Communication Skills Mastery Curriculum. Mr. Bobro has a passion for rock and ice climbing, alpine mountaineering, and adventure racing. His mountaineering and racing exploits have been chronicled by Windy City Sports, Private Clubs, Metro Sports, Red Book, Vertical Jones, the Chicago Tribune, and other publications. By soliciting pledges and corporate sponsorship, he has used many of his events as vehicles to raise both awareness and funds for a number of philanthropic organizations. To learn more, visit www.climbforacause.org and smiletree.org. Danny, you're an amazing man, and you've been an amazing man for decades. I don't, I don't know how you have the time and energy to do all that you do. So how, how old is American Dental Marketing? You'd have to ask my wife uh, to find out just how amazing I am, but, uh, and I'm not sure what she'd say. Uh, <laughs> American Dental Corp was founded uh, in 1989. In fact, last July, we celebrated 27 years helping dentists to, as we like to say, uh, improve practice income while improving patient outcomes. And that's AmericanDentalMarketing.com. Explain to my homies what they'd find at that website and what you actually do. And, and I want to tell my homies something. Um, dentistry is a very small industry. It's, it kind of reminds me of a small rural town. You, you sneeze on one side and someone on the other end of town says, uh, thank you. You can't, you can't have a dental company or a consulting company for 30 years without making a hell of a lot of dentists happy because they, they'd run you out of town, especially things like Dental Town. Some of these companies, and some have been from Chicago where you live, where they, they get up and going, and without a, in a year, they're out of business because everybody's got their, uh, got their number. And uh, you've been doing AmericanDentalMarketing.com for, what you say, 27 years? Right. We're the second oldest marketing firm in the country. What's the oldest one? Chris Ad, my buddy John Christensen. Chris Ad. Now, Chris Ad is um, the, the coupon mailing book? No, no, that's maybe Valpac. You think? Oh, that's Valpac. Yeah. No, John Christensen is a uh, uh, a full service marketing consultancy. I'm I'll be happy to explain to you all about uh, my, my 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 esteemed colleague. Uh, but no, he's been around for I think 35 years, based in California. It does a nice job as well. Yeah. So what what have you been doing for 27 years at AmericanDentalMarketing.com? Well, American Dental Corp is sort of the umbrella group. We, we do business as a number of different organizations, uh, depending on what service we're being asked to provide. But uh, you've been around uh, long enough you know, to know that what you said is 
is, is absolutely true. I think the reason, the key to our longevity, as I like to say, is that we under-promise and over-deliver. And uh, we, too, have seen these waves of uh, entrants who, either by design or a lack of understanding of what it takes to, uh, to persist and, 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 and sustain in this industry, have come and gone rather quickly. So, Danny, what's working in marketing? And, and by, by the way, I'm not a big marketing fan. The reason is, is if, um, like, you know, I, I'm repeating myself a lot, but, you know, there's 52 weeks in a year. We'll give everybody two weeks vacation. That means the hygienist is going to see everybody every six months. So she's going to, uh, 32 hours a week if she works Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, times 25 weeks is 800 patients. She can see 800 people twice a year. So if your office gets 25 new patients a month, every two and a half years, you'd add another hygienist. But you go to any dental office and every two and a half years, they never add any hygiene capacity. You come at the end of a decade, two decades, three decades, four decades, they still have one hygienist four days a week, which mathematically only means every time you throw a new patient on her recall, six month recall, someone else has to come off. So so do you think, do you think, you know, just wanting an unlimited supply of new patients is the drug that keeps dentists from investing money on trying to keep customers for life? Well, I think, you know, there's a couple of implicit assumptions in the math that you made, uh, which is that every dentist, every patient comes in every six months. Uh, they may or may not. And the other point is that, you know, like uh, our colleagues in the medical profession, they get squeezed, their margins get squeezed because of the, uh, the reimbursement levels that the third party payers are giving them. So they wind up spending less time. And that's, that's a downward vortex that you want to avoid, which is spending less time with your patients. Because as you know, the hygiene is the opportunity to diagnose and, uh, and really connect emotionally. It's the hygienist that really builds the relationship with the practice. So if they're not adding hygienists, then there's some other, uh, other leakage taking place, which is, you know, typically they're spending less time or there's attrition. They're replacing people coming in with people going out. So, Danny, when you started 27 years ago, it was all fee for service. Now it's changed over to 82% of the dentists are taking PPOs, which is about a 40% reduction in fee. How, how, is that, how do you think that's changed dentistry? Just as it's changed medicine. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, it changes it for the worse because now the doctor feels under pressure to, to, make, to make as much money as they're making to cover their costs, their debt load, their other legitimate expenses. I mean, they work hard to get where they are. Uh, they have to work harder to make the same amount of money. And that often can mean cutting costs. But as you mentioned, and as you know, I'm in very passionate about uh, oral systemic health, helping not just the lay public, but health professionals as well to understand the links between oral and overall health and all the uh, wonderful implications that has for health and longevity. So a practice that adopts that model can really uh, break free of the, uh, the insurance treadmill by offering elective services, but services that communicated in the right way at the right time, patients will only be too happy to accept. And are you finding success with that? Well, we are. You know, my, my niche, although I, I don't refuse to work with practices that don't embrace this uh, model, but we certainly encourage them to, because, you know, I think it's, uh, it's win-win. First of all, when you adopt this model, you encourage, hopefully it encourages you to practice what you preach, to lead by example, which means to understand what the links are, maybe modify your habits a little bit uh, on, on every front, activity, nutrition, oral health, uh, screening, opportunities to find out, you know, where you are in terms of inflammatory markers and uh, mouth bacteria that have implications for, uh, you know, for the health of the body. So uh, we're seeing a lot of success, but it's not an overnight thing. You know, sometimes uh, people are their own worst enemy. They, they get the, uh, they they're get the, always their own worst enemy. They're always, they always want to blame it on something else, but they're always their own worst enemy. I agree with that. They get the zealotry of the recent convert and then they expect their enthusiasm to be contagious and self-evident and their patients wind up staring at them like they're speaking another language and they just scare the bejesus out of them. So that's why I say, and a lot of what we do is we coach people on the art of first impressions. It begins on the telephone. But we really want people to understand that 
people don't care what you know until they know how much you care about them. I'm sure you've heard that. The way to do that is to understand that you need to connect with people emotionally before they give a hoot about the details. And that's all about establishing rapport, conveying empathy, exuding enthusiasm, learning how to ask the right questions in the right way at the right time, and then aggressively listening to understand what's important to this patient now, to this prospective patient now, and then running the race at their pace. Because as uh, several of your other guests have mentioned, uh, if you try to oversell, even if what you, it's always what you believe is in their best interest, but if you communicate in a language that they don't understand or that they're not ready to accept, you're not doing anybody any good because you're never going to have that relationship, which would give you then an opportunity to educate and earn their trust and appreciation over time, over their time frame. You know, Danny, me and my two associates at Today's Dental, you know, went to college for eight years to be a dentist. The hygienists all went to school for four years. My assistant, Janie, has been with me since day one, went to school for a year to be a certified dental assistant. But the receptionists, they're just hired off the street. They're thrown at the front. The dentist will always buy a laser and a CAD cam. But if you ask him a simple question like, how many phone calls did you get last month? No idea. If you say, well, how many strange numbers that are not in your practice manager system have to call before you get one patient in the chair? No idea. And their, their receptionist had zero training. They never went to school. They don't have a diploma. Do, and that's the, the, the only link of the office to the outside world. I mean, the most important person, who the hell open answers the phone? And that's the least trained person in the office. Do you see that as a huge problem in dentistry? Yes. Yes, I do. And if you didn't say it, I would have. It's sort of ironic, isn't it? That the person who is the forward facing, really the only forward facing voice uh, of the practice is the one that got the least training and is probably paid the least. And, and the so, doctor always saves money by going to the, the CE courses alone to save money. He wouldn't even ever consider taking the receptionist with him. And, and that's the person who's going to be on the front line that has to know everything. Crazy. Right. And that's where the highest turnover is too, typically. Uh, or you have a receptionist who's been around forever and is doing it their way. You know, sometimes I wonder who's in charge of certain practices uh, because we've had situations, and I will tell you that our clients know how many calls they're getting. Not only do we listen, not only do we quantify the response, but a long time ago, with everyone's permission, we got the opportunity to listen to the conversations because even the dentist who thinks they know what's going on at the front desk, and of course they don't, because even if they were there all the time, they're only hearing half the conversation. The other important factor is that they don't necessarily know what to listen for themselves. I've had several situations when we've uh, been discussing the, the art of first impressions, the, the coaching curriculum with a the, with the practice owner, and we say, well, what do you think about these calls? And he or she will say, oh, I thought they did a good job. And it, 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 they didn't do a good job. They just didn't realize the opportunities that they missed. Or they are victim of certain preconceived notions themselves, like anybody that would dare ask how much a crown costs, or if you're in their insurance plan, is somehow not worthy of your attention, that the, that the reception is doing a, a service to the practice by weeding out the bad callers, if you will. And that's something that we have to start with. Square one. I spend a lot of time in our training connecting with the, with the people that I'm going to be asked to coach, as well as the practice owner, so that they understand, I, I'm on your team. I'm not some outsider who's been hired to clean up the town, get rid of the deadwood. I am going to show you how to be more indispensable to your team by first and foremost helping you understand why we're suggesting that maybe you consider modifying your communication a little bit, not just saying, do it. Because if you do that, some of them will do it, but they'll do it grudgingly. And as soon as nobody's looking, they'll go back to their own uh, habits because all creatures, not even just humans, are creatures of habit. We don't like to, we don't like change. We don't like to have to modify our neural pathways to adopt some new behavior unless we're given a compelling reason to do so. So how do you, what, what is the actual equipment? I mean, how, how, does, how does a dentist driving to work right now make it so they can track their phone calls um, do you recommend that they also uh, track the number of calls, the length of calls? Do you also recommend recording the calls? Um, how does this actually happen? How, how could they implement that? Sure. 
it's really simple. And and by the way, we don't really want to monitor all calls because frankly, uh, never thought of this analogy before, but really the call from a prospective patient is the tip of the iceberg. That's the only call that we're concerned with. We pretty much know that when a current patient calls with whom the team already have a relationship, by and large, they're going to do fine with that. You know, are, are there some some other suggestions we can make in terms of uh, positioning and, and, and communicating things more effectively? Absolutely. But I'm often reminded of the song, New York, New York. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Here is if you can successfully and consistently connect with prospective patients on the phone, communicating in person with current patients or on the phone with current patients is a relatively simple matter. Now, in answer to your question on how we track, any marketing that we do, or even if we don't do it, we provide a telephone tracking number. It's a unique number that would go on the client's website. It would go on their direct mail pieces. It would go on anything else that they do, in, which is intended to solicit a call from a prospective patient. In that way, we're able to know not only the total number of prospective patient calls you receive, but also the source of those calls. Now, I just got an email before I jumped on with you from a prospective client who said, how are we gonna track these? Are we gonna have to get a new telephone number? And the answer is you get an additional telephone number, but there's absolutely no investment required in equipment or technology. It's a seamless transfer, other than the fact that most states require that you let people know. You'll often hear for quality control purposes, this call is being monitored. We say to help ensure you receive the best, the, the highest level of care, this call is being recorded. And then it gets transferred, and now we know, because we are able to track and only listen to those calls, because who wants to listen to 1,000 calls or however many calls, 2,000 calls that a practice gets in a month? What we do want to listen to and key into are those unique first calls. Those are the ones that represent the opportunity for the, for the well, the greatest challenge and the greatest opportunity for improvement. Do you think it's bizarre in cities where the biggest law firm is always trying to brand a phone number? And if you look at the back of the yellow pages, the billboard, the TV, it's all the same number. And, you're, and I'm just thinking, how would you track that? How would you know the difference between TV, billboard, yellow pages if you're branding some number? Do you think branding a number is a bad idea? Two questions there, uh, at least. Uh, I would say that if you can find a, a memorable, logical uh, vanity number, as they're called, uh, I would go for it, and I wouldn't worry so much about the specific source. Most of these law firms are just doing you know, what, what you said. They're, um, they're putting a number on a billboard, and if you're going to billboard advertise, it's got to be memorably simple, because how much time do you have exposed to the driver? You know, you, In those cases, your, your goals are a little bit uh, contrary to the driver, because you're hoping that, uh, that it's rush hour and that they're not moving, right? <laughs> because then they got plenty of time to see the billboard, but you got to assume they won't. So if you have a number that they can't remember, remember really quickly, like, I don't know, 888 injury, or injury, whatever seven letters is, uh, you're probably wasting your money on a billboard. So you got to have it memorable. Does it pose challenges with, with tracking the specific source? Yeah, it does. But if you could snag a number like, you know, I don't know, like 800 dentists, for instance, uh, they're not so concerned about exactly where that call came just that the calls are coming fred joyle the man so you're seeing lawyer if they just had a civil number like 888 scumbag or 188 dirt oh, that's a good one they remember that <laughs> everyone remember so um so so they call you how, how much does this cost they're, they're they call you up you're going to give them a tracking number and you're going to give them different tracking numbers for the mobile the the website on their mobile versus a direct mail piece versus a yellow page or talk about that more but we can when you're talking about web-based marketing Howard uh, that's a different story if you can get really granular because then you can do proxy uh, I think they're called proxy rewrites which is the same ad will appear with a different telephone number based on if you're talking about paid search what ad you're actually promoting if you're promoting veneers or you're promoting implants it's valuable to know which of those is generating the most calls right and which calls are being generated because then you can track them through and see which ones became patients. Some, you, some ads might generate a lot of calls like, like free dentistry. You get a lot of calls and they find out it isn't free, you wasted your money and their time, right? So you can set up your AdWords campaign so that every ad will result in a different telephone number. 
that way we know not only that this lead, ideally this patient, came from an AdWords campaign, but we know which ad generated a specific lead. Now, when you say AdWords, does that always mean Google or could that? AdWords always means Google pay per click. Uh, pay per click is the generic term, which could mean Facebook or Yelp or Twitter. I mean, everyone's getting into that act now. So what are, what are you doing for your clients right now? So they, they call you up, they go to AmericanDentalMarketing.com. Um, do they pay you? How, how, do you, how do you get paid for this? What, what is the fee for this? We work on a project basis and they sort of get my consulting and insights value. You know, they can assess whatever value they attribute to that. Uh, that kind of comes along. I, I do have a few, a handful of clients on retainer. But primarily what we do is, because I try to model my relationship with my clients off of what I model my relationship with my vendors, if you will, or my consultants. Uh, I like to know what I'm paying and what I'm paying for. And the, the investment runs the gamut. Literally, I've got some clients that are sending me $40 a month. I've got some that are sending me six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month. The $40 a month folks are, when we started this business in 1989, all we knew how to do was broker lists of new residents. And we, we'd say, all right, you know, people moving out of the neighborhood, people are moving in, they're going to maybe want to look for a dentist because they moved too far away to make it convenient. And uh, that's what we marketed. I still have a handful of clients that that's all we're doing for them. I mean, they're retiring, you know, almost on a daily basis, but uh, that's all we did. We quickly learned that the best you can hope for from a new resident marketing program is the stem attrition. Basically, as we said earlier, replace moving people out with people moving in. If that's all you're interested in doing, that can work for you. But we're a full service marketing consultancy. You know, my, my career has been an exercise in adding, finding one link in the chain that's weak or broken and trying to fix it. Now, we don't do everything, although I do try to be aware of who does what well. So if you're looking for someone to help ensure HIPAA compliance or, uh, you know, security of your uh, personal uh, patient credit information, I can hook you up with some people that I know. But the knitting that we stick to is really um, our get the phone to ring service, which is done under AIM Dental Marketing, our telephone skills mastery, which is done under the art of first impressions, and which ideally really should be addressed before you pay money to get your phone to ring. Because if you think about it, this is anecdotal, but in our analyses, the average practice will convert 30 to 50% of prospective patient calls into an appointment. The well-trained or master telephone communicators, as we call them, can convert 90%. You do the math, and I know you're a math guy. If you can convert, if you can increase from 30% to 90%, you just tripled your new patient flow without spending an extra dollar on marketing. So why wouldn't you do that first? And, uh, you know, fortunately, the practices are beginning to realize that this is a problem or that their team could be better at converting calls. This was unknown. I mean, when I first started my business and for the next 15 years, when I talked to a new client and I would talk about the telephone, they would basically say a variant on the following. You just get the phone to ring and we'll take it from there. And when we started listening and tracking, we found out where they were taking it from there, which was down, down the tubes. So, but now most practices understand that it, 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 it's, a, uh, it's an area that needs and deserves attention. So, you know, get the phone to ring, first make sure that the phones are being handled properly. And then as you know, I'm very passionate about helping these practices adopt an oral systemic practice model so that they can really uh, practice what I think is the new standard of care. And, uh, you know, zero tolerance for bleeding gums, offering protocols to help uh, identify periodontal disease before it manifests into what I consider to be an end stage symptom, which is bleeding or deep pockets, uh, getting involved in oral cancer screening, which is a really great example of how to blur the distinction in perception between dentist and physician. And that's what has to happen. People essentially don't, as we all know, in general, they, they tend not to respect the profession of dentistry as much as they do the profession of medicine. And it's, you know, you can go back 150 years to figure out why that happened, but the fact is it's wrong and it doesn't serve anybody. That's why I'm very passionate about helping encourage, basically uh, expand the three C's of oral systemic health, as I call them. The three C's being clinical protocols, 
collaborative uh, collaborative technique to help ins um, encourage additions to your professional referral network and communication, which is really just another word for marketing, but two C's and an M just didn't roll off the tongue as nicely. Communication has to do with letting your current and prospective patients know about your commitment to this and understanding how to communicate it in a way that makes them care and understand that you're just not another dentist. Because as you know, for many years, dentists did a very good job of making themselves indistinguishable from one another. And that doesn't do anyone a service because people like- the first C? First C is clinical. So things like oral cancer screenings or blood tests uh, for CRP, TNF alpha, uh, IL-6, you know, these other inflammatory markers, uh, oral DNA tests to check what the, what the bacteria present in the mouth is, uh, carotid intermedial thickness as a, as a marker for our arterial uh, atherosclerosis, other coronary uh, diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And you can't just throw this at people, you know, overnight. But what you can do is through effective communication, understand what's important to them. A great opening question is, what kind of a dentist are you looking for? Because the implicit answer in their mind is, well, aren't all dentists the same? And now that they've asked the question, you've been given permission to elaborate about how your practice maybe is a little different and how when they're ready to learn more about that, you'll be happy to share it with them. But for now, how can we be of assistance? Because again, if they're thinking fill and drill, or as I often talk to dentists that are getting more and more increasingly involved in the placement and not just restoration of implants, they're all about wanting to optimize their website for implants, which is great. But I say, why don't you optimize it for dentures? And they go, well, I don't really want to do dentures. I go, fine. But that's what people are searching for. And if you believe that implants are a preferable or at least a reasonable alternative in some situations to dentures, don't you want to have that conversation with people who think the dentures are the only option? You know, it's amazing. I, I mean, the last 30 years, I can give you the names of just dozens of my friends who, uh, when they went to the town, nobody was, to buy a practice, nobody was looking at the downtown denture world or denture universe in the poor part of town. It was some denture factory doing about $300,000 a year doing a bunch of dentures. And they went and got their diplomat in the International Congress Oral Pontology. And they went into this denture world clinic where for forever, for 30 years, all these poor grandmas and grandpas and everybody's going there. And then they just start slowly upgrading a lot of them to, uh, uh, you know, an overdenture with two or an overdenture with four. Maybe one out of 50 would go for uh, full mouth uh, implants. And But anyway, long story short, most of these guys bought a $300,000 practice and upgraded it to about a three to $4 million business just by going in there. So you're exactly right. If you wanted to get into implants, the first thing you'd get into is dentures. Right. There's gold in them, their mouths, right? I mean, it's just. So, so Danny, what, what are they looking for? I mean, and, and how are you making phone calls ring? What, what are people searching for? I assume when people are looking for a dentist, they want a short, fat, bald one. Is that the number one search? Uh, so fat, bald dentist in Phoenix? Definitely a long tail term, Howard. But I, in your case, I would recommend that you optimize for it. Absolutely. <laughs> By the way, they say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. You, you can, you notice my haircut. It's very similar to yours. That's because we're so athletic. There was just not enough nutrition left over to feed our food, our hair. So, right. so, so what are, what are people searching for on the internet? I, I, I do believe there's a total disconnect on what Dennis believe. I see it in the same day crown stuff you always hear. You hear all these people say, well, you know, everybody wants the same day crown. I'm pretty sure when you tell someone they need a crown, half the questions are, how much is it going to cost? Will you take my insurance? I don't get paid till Friday. Can I bill me? And the other half are going to be, oh my God, am I going to get a shot? Are you going to hurt me? Am I going to, can you knock me out? Do you have laughing gas? But the dentists all want to hear that they all want a same day crown. Are people really searching? I want a dentist that'll make me a same day crown or is that kind of a fantasy? It's not a fantasy. You know, fortunately, there are the companies out there that, that deliver the milling equipment are, are marketing to the end user, and therefore there is some awareness of it. But there, it's far from the, the, the highest volume search term. But your question was a little bit more fundamental than that is, what are we doing to get the phone to ring? And uh, I will tell you that until 99, which is really when the Internet became available in a large scale for commercial interest. In 99? Yeah, well, that's when I became aware of it. I remember... 
I just forgot. AdWords was called. I'm so Overture. proud. Dental Town was launched in '98. I I just I was I I had that first mover advantage. I was so fortunate. I saw that. But anyway, so you're saying the internet started in '99 and Dental Town was already there in '98. And Facebook right. was until 2004. I beat well, Facebook by six years. Well, in 95, I was pitched on my first website. And they wanted $25,000 for a website, which, you know, I think we were using 600 baud modems at the time. So I don't know. But uh, so what we're doing, what we did until 99, that's when we got heavily into it. Overture, I think, was the original name of AdWords when I got my first uh, yeah, paper. Yeah, that's a blast from the past. It, I just, I'm proud of myself for remembering that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but until then, I mean, we were heavy on direct mail, but we were, we got involved in public relations and you know about Climb for a Cause. I'm proud to say you were an early adopter of that. You, you climbed with us in 2001. You remember Howard? With, with, um, Levin, um, Lauren. Lauren Levin. Of, uh, what's his company, Lauren Levin? Um, Dental Technology. He's the digital dentist. Good yeah, friend the of digital mine. dentist. Yeah, he was a periodontist back then. He was just switching over. That's right. He was out of uh, Burlington, Vermont. Now he's in Southern California. Uh, I had he, so much fun on that climb. That was amazing. It was Mount Adams, right? Yes, sir. It was. And, and you didn't go up the easy side. You crazy Danny wanted to go up the ice face. And I kept thinking the whole trip. Why don't we walk up the back of this mountain? And he's like, oh, no. You want to climb the ice wall in the front <laughs> with crampons. Well, you made it. And you, you remember we got weathered in, too, and we, uh, we kind of oh. ran low on food. You remember that? Oh, yeah. That was, uh, that was, that was a blast. How, how's Climb for a Cause? That's Climb for a Cause, not letter four, but Climb, F-O-R, a cause dot org. And that was raising money for dental <laughs> clinics in, in foreign countries. Wasn't it like Vietnam? You got it. Bingo. At the time, it was Vietnam. We were supporting Operation Smiles, one and only dental clinic, which uh, the founder, Bill and Kathy McGee's son, Billy, was managing in Hanoi. And I had the pleasure of visiting that four times and participating. Uh, you know, they kept me away from the patients with anything pointy because you know how good my eyesight is. But uh, it was it was really very rewarding. A answer your question. This uh, October first, we're uh, we're climbing Mount Charleston again, which that's you it. also yeah, that's north. That's the biggest mountain in Nevada, north of Vegas. Yeah, it's the large. It's the tallest mountain in southern Nevada. It's not actually the tallest peak in Nevada. The other one is not accessible at all. But we're it's almost twelve thousand feet. That'll be our nineteenth annual, if you can believe it. And uh, and guess who's going to be on it? Who? Lauren Levine. And when when is that? That's October 1st. Uh, we're pretty much booked. We got we set records. Now, the one we did in 01, we had like 25, 27 climbers, which was pretty darn good. Uh, the last three years, we've been over 60, and that's about all we can handle. Frankly. Nice, nice. And, and where's the money going for this one now, Climb for a Cause? Well, we've expanded. Uh, we support a number of oral health education and treatment projects overseas and domestically. We support oral cancer treatment also. But since our founding, we have funded, staffed, supplied, um, and otherwise supported 70 projects. We've treated, we've delivered first-time care to 50,000-plus children and with equivalent uh, dental care valued at $10 million. So we're making a big difference, especially overseas. We're in, um, we're in Nepal, India, Guatemala. You know, sometimes we work ourselves out of a job. We're not in Vietnam anymore. We had other groups that came in that were better healed. And, you know, it's sort of an incubator. It's interesting. And this goes back to doing well by doing good. A lot of companies recognize the value of cause marketing and more dentists need to. But, like, in South America, you know what the word for toothpaste is? At least Colgate. in the States. Colgate. You got it. Yep. That's no, that's no coincidence. So they go in and they fund these projects. We gratefully bow out because then we're freed up to sort of be the uh, the, the advance guard or the, you know, the point man in other projects. And then when the market potential is, is realized, then some other company comes in. And I'm only too happy to serve that purpose. I just want to explain that to the, the kids out there that, um, you know, like when the first tissue came out was Kleenex. So even though no one hardly buys Kleenex anymore, people say, hand me a Kleenex. And in yep. most countries of the world, there is no word for toothpaste. It's just Colgate. Mama will say, put some Colgate on that, even though they may be using another brand. 
Exactly. And, uh, and Colgate's only too happy about that. And Xerox is another one. Go Xerox to copy that even though you're using a Canon. That's right. Exactly. Go Xerox it. You got it. And they can't even, um, you know, it becomes public domain and, uh, you know, it, it loses its meaning. So, really Danny, is cause marketing, I and, mean, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people think they're genius because they can point out, you know, half the planet's girls and half boys. You know, that's pretty amateur. Some people think they're genius by uh, pointing out pigmentation that this guy's Asian and Hispanic and Irish. But uh, the geniuses are the ones that realize that elderly think differently than baby boomers who think differently than generation next or millennials is this cause marketing does marketing to a, a millennial or generation X different than a uh um a baby boomer like me or the greatest generation who's currently retired right now well thanks for asking that howard that's uh that's a question i hadn't even uh hoped you'd ask but it's a great one because the answer is absolutely uh, I do speak on uh, you know a number of topics, and one of the topics that I speak on is do well by doing good. And I explain the concept of cause marketing or cross-sector partnerships, as they're called. And one of the things I mentioned is that there have been a number of different studies that have shown that, in general, given a choice between different vendors or different dentists or different services, that the one that demonstrates a commitment to social responsibility is more likely to get your business. But this increases as you get younger. The millennials are far more motivated uh, and driven by this relationship, by this demonstration. And I'm really we're kind of relieved to learn that, aren't you? Because if the trend were the opposite, which one could argue could be because, you know, people argue that kids have a short attention span and they're materialistic and that smartphones make dumb people. But nonetheless, when it gets down to the really essential human element, they seem to be right on in understanding that uh, that they they want to know a little bit about the the soul, not just the the mind of the person they're dealing with. And by the way, this benefit doesn't just inure to the patient practice relationship. It's also the team that would rather work for a practice that commits to a purpose that's bigger than itself. Uh, there there are studies upon studies that show that that client that worker retention is higher among those companies that have demonstrated this commitment to social responsibility. So it's really something to, to look at. It's true, because humans want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Once their basic material needs and income needs are met, that's absolutely right. So can I, so go back, what what are these people looking for on the internet? What what, what are the Google searches that pertain to the dental industry? What 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 is the most relevant? But well, we've covered direct mail a little bit and, and public relations a little bit. Cause marketing is the way I like to do it. What they're looking on the, for on the Internet is still a lot of basic stuff. You know, uh, pain-free, dentist in your town, uh, veneers, cosmetic, sedation, implants. Uh, we're, we're not seeing anything on oral systemic yet because that's not a household word. That's not even used among a lot of dental professionals. However, we do recommend that we optimize for that term because I believe that it's going to trend. And the time to optimize for a term that's going to be popular is when it's not, because it's cheaper and easier. But, you know, again, this gets back to dentures. So it gets back to you've got to. And what we do is we don't we know sort of in general what what's happening across the country. But when we get a new client, the first thing we do is uh, what we call our, our, our Internet marketing performance assessment. And. Specifically, we check how well is your website, let me rephrase that, how well is your web presence, because it's a lot more than your website these days, how well is your web presence taking AIM? And AIM stands for three criteria which the successful web presence must meet. And that is, how well does it attract? How well does it impress? And how well does it motivate people who eventually get to your property, be it a, a directory, a review site, your website, or your social media platform? So we evaluate, the first thing we do is we look at the, uh, uh, we generate a keyword search table. We'll look at maybe 300 different keywords in your community and see what the recent activity has been. In other words, how many people have been searching for those terms? And then we present that to the client and say, well, based on this, you may want to optimize for, uh, I don't know, you know, like a, like a West Town Dentist. And you think people use that term online, but they don't. 
So we can optimize for it, but you really ought to keep your financial powder dry to optimize for the following terms where there's a lot of activity. Let's let's go to websites. Um, don't you think most dentists have a canned website that they bought at a dental convention eight years ago and nothing's ever been done to it since? I mean, what yes. what, 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 what what is that the standard? Um, I mean, there's 211,000 dentists in America. What percent of them would you say don't have a website or have a canned website they bought at a convention five years ago, 10 years ago and done nothing with it? Certainly the number, the percentage that have a website is increasing all the time, but I would venture that still 20 to 40% may not, probably closer to 20% these days. I don't know that, but- Oh, I, you know. I find it all the time. Whenever a dentist sends me an email, I always want to know who I'm, I'm talking to. And yeah, I'd say, uh, I'd say a third don't have a website. But yeah. okay, so but those who do have a website, how many of those would you say you give their website an A? Well, uh, when we give them a website report card, we check how well their website attracts, impresses, and motivates. So they get a different grade for each of these criteria. And by the way, we give them a grade on how it plays to two different audiences. Because one audience, of course, ultimately it's all human beings. But one audience is human beings that have already been gotten to your website. You handed them a business card or somehow they found you because they knew your name and now they're staring at your website. So how well does it attract, does it impress and motivate them once they're on the website? But the other audience, as you know, is the, the traffic cop, which is the Google, which is Google primarily. And that's the, the search engine, which is really standing between you and the, and the prospective patient because Google decides how to rank your website. And they do that based on an algorithm, which they keep, you know, they'll never divulge it completely because then everybody would gain the system. But uh, so we will evaluate a website based on how it plays to both Google and to the human eyeballs. Uh, your original question was how many can sites are there? And, you know, they said how many would get an A. Uh, I have to tell you, and this may go counter to your belief. First of all, I think most of them are. But, you know, if you think you've got a given budget to invest in marketing, and again, marketing your website doesn't mean just spending it all on a beautiful website. Because what good is the website if nobody finds it, right? And what good is it if nobody is motivated to take any action once they land on your website? So we say if you've got a given amount of budget, which everyone does, for your website, you should only make a reasonable investment in the design. The design has got to be uh, proper. It's got to be optimized and user friendly. But I think sometimes dentist egos get in the way. They want to show piece, show, showcase website that will win awards nationwide when their market with very few exceptions, maybe Ellen Dorfman being one of them, or I mean, Bill Dorfman, sorry, Ellen Dorfman was a, was a hood uh, from Chicago. Uh, so my apologies. But unless you're not you know, one of those celebrity dentists, you're really drawing from a rather local area. You're a local area marketer. So there's nothing inherently wrong with having a website that may look like some other websites as long as they're nowhere near your community. So that's what we do typically. I mean, we, we do design very nice websites, but we're not gonna charge an arm and a leg to design a website. We'd rather keep that, that funds, those funds available so that we can get people to the website and we can motivate them to take action once they're on the website. And um, so what percent of the current available websites would you say are canned? You well, know, if by canned, they didn't have some uh, former Leo Burnett designer uh, design it for them, I don't know, 80, 90 percent? Yeah, 80, 90 percent. Um, I... I think I bought mine from, do you know who, where mine was bought from? Uh, can you tell by the website, todaysdental.com? Uh, is it, uh, it's, it's a real big one. It was out of Seattle. You haven't looked at it. Don't know. Um, yeah. Well, hey, I think it'd be neat for the podcast. Uh, how, mu how much do you, co the people listening, how much does it cost for them to uh, go to your website, um, AmericanDentalMarketing.com to get a report card on their website? Well, what we charge is three ninety five for our uh, internet marketing performance assessment, and uh, it's very thorough. And the reason we charge for that is a because we spend money and we take a lot of time to do this analysis. It's nothing that we push buttons to generate, and then we schedule a one hour meeting 
to present our findings, we then put together some very uh, specific recommendations and proposals. They get the recommendations as part of the initial meeting. And, you know, we hope and believe based on the credibility that we hope we've established and, and our pricing that they'll choose to work with us, but they're not obligated to. And in any case, what they end up with is a very nice uh, set of, of recommendations that they can attempt to implement themselves or they can take to have someone else do for them. And that's why we do request some sort of compensation, just so we know we're not wasting our time. And also, more importantly, they're going to get value for that regardless. So, so I'm a, I'm a uh, selfish bastard and do these uh, podcasts all for free. I will I will hire you to do mine. Now, would, um, mine's today's dental. I think it'd be a fun case study. It might be something even publishable because a lot of people, even, a lot of I might people, even do yours for free, Howard. You should drive a harder bargain. Well, you know, I think um, it should be publishable because I think a lot of people think, well, my, my website's amazing. And so they might think, well, Howard's got a, a he's, he's 54. He's got an MBA. His is perfect. And then Danny's probably going to find out it ain't perfect. By the way, would you, is that only B2C websites? Like Dentaltown is a B2B website just for dentists. Does Good the point. same metrics apply? No. I mean, attracting, impressing, and motivating, yes. But, you know, it, we, we look at, well, who's your audience? Who are you trying to attract, impress, and motivate? Well, today's dental, it's patients, consumers, and in dental town, it's just dentist. I know. So which one would you want analyzed? I'm only going to do one for free. Well, then do one for free, and I'll pay for the other one. Okay. No, that, got- that's how much respect I have for you. I, I, I think you're an, you're an amazing man, and I think that um, as, as much as I'm against marketing, I mean, I really am, because when you go to a dentist and say, well, you know, you, you said pain-free. So I'll say, um, you, you said one of the biggest searches is pain-free, and I'll say, hey, have you ever thought about buying a wand? Oh, that's 3000 bucks. I don't want to do that. So they'll lose a patient because the shot hurt and doesn't come back, but they want a new patient. And then you said uh, um, dentist in your, or sedation. I'll say, well, why don't you plumb all your operatories for nitrous oxide? Nah, that's too expensive. I don't want to do that. There's no PPO code for nitrous oxide. So then they, the patient doesn't come back. Um, dentures, you say, well, why don't, why don't you go – Take this uh, denture course on Dental Town. It's eighteen bucks, and learn how to make dentures better. No, nah, I don't want. So they they never want it. Um, their patients are calling. Are you open early morning, evening, any Saturdays? No. Uh, they just say no all day long, piss everyone off, and then come back to you and say, Danny, can you give me a new bunch? I need a hundred new people that I can piss off that never come back. And it seems like the offices that I've seen after thirty years that made the biggest impact focused on patient retention. Okay, so you, your premise of that statement was that you're against marketing. No, no, that it that that marketing should be. If you spend three percent on marketing, you should spend three percent on patient loyalty. If you got five percent of your budget for patient marketing, then you should have five percent of your patient for patient loyalty. I'll give you another example. Um, dentists always have money for their largest expense. They always make payroll on the first and fifteenth, and that's like. After you make payroll, who gives a crap what the water bill is or the electric bill? I mean, when I go into a dental office and see a lockbox over the thermostat, I'm thinking, dude, you don't even get it. I mean, it's labor. But then when you ask them to buy something for their uh, labor to make them work faster, you know, they, they don't want to spend the money. They always get the money for the labor, but they never have the money for any capital goods that would make that labor maybe get done twice as much work for that same labor cost. So, so no, I'm not against marketing at all. I just think that if you spend a dollar on marketing, you should spend a dollar on patient loyalty. You should try to keep those customers for life. That's called putting the horse before the cart. And I could not agree more. Uh, one irony is that the, uh, the first uh, newsletter we ever, we ever sent out in 1989 talked about the tendency for dentists to amass debt by investing in technological wonders and there were far fewer ones then than there are now and that they would actually be more more likely to invest in that than they were in marketing and so they'd have a lot of invested capital in some in some whiz bang technology and no one to 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 use it on so you know that was one thing but to your point this is all about having your internal house in order to me having those I mean, you got to be realistic too. But you know, I would, I agree to a large degree. But I feel that if you're going to invest in technology, you'd better also be investing in effective marketing. But see, for me, 
the first step of effective marketing is to make sure that you've got the communication skills down yourself and your team so that when that phone does ring, when that patient does enter your, the threshold of your office, you're able to uh, maximize patient value, which means, by the way, fortunately, two sides of the same coin, maximizing the value of the practice to the patient and in like fashion, the, the value of the patient to the practice. So I agree with you completely. You got to have your internal house in order. And if you don't have hours, that's another really excellent point. You know, I got this from John, John Christensen. Uh, uh, Target lost its uh, franchise in Canada. They had had trouble with their supply chain. And when people went into the store, the shelves were virtually empty. And so they changed their shopping habits and they never went back. Well, inventory in the dental setting is available appointment time. These days, if it were ever not the case, people shouldn't be expected to take their kid out of school or to miss work just for a hygiene appointment. And this is one of those rare cases where if you build it, they will come. When somebody, especially a new patient says, you know, do you have, can I, can I come in on Saturday? No. Can I come in the morning? No. Well, if everything is no, we can't, then how do you expect to grow your practice? So sometimes it takes a leap of faith because you do have to stay open to have these extended hours to accommodate new patients. Because if you don't have them, and then you blame your marketing firm for, you know, hey, this isn't working. Well, you know, our records show that we're, we're getting the phone to ring off the hook. Yeah, but we're not converting patients. Well, our listening to the calls also indicates that your team could use a little bit of coaching on how to be a little nicer and connect emotionally. And by the way, people are asking reasonable questions about availability, and your answer is more often than not, no, we can't. So you're right. You're setting yourself up for failure. And if that's the case, you might as well save your money and not market. That was a lot, a lot of wisdom, a lot, of, a lot of wisdom. So if some dentist is listening and, and just basics, he doesn't have a website. Who would you recommend to build their website? Us. Okay. By the way, you said earlier that you had a list of uh, experts that you use if they needed HIPAA or this or that. How many, how many experts do you use? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I have a, uh, if I go right now to my directory, well, I wouldn't count them, but I have a business to business. Uh, well, you know, it, it, anyway, I just, I just want to say that, um, I, I do a show every day and I respect your, uh, wisdom and judgment for 30 years. Um, if you, uh, send any of those people an invite to be on my show, um, I'll do it. Just tell them Danny sent you and that would be all the uh, screening I would need for them. Well, you know, I will. I, I, I already do. I already do because, you know, I told you offline, Howard, I have utmost respect for what you do. I mean, this is this is fun for the, uh, I hope it's fun for you. It's certainly fun for me and your other uh, uh, interviewees, but you really have broadened the world for people. It seems like every other uh, guest you have is, is, is practicing or, or working overseas, and it gives some great insights into their, how things are done over there and how they perceive us, and it's a lot of food for thought. So my hat's off to you. Well, that. thanks. I, you know, they always say, uh, think outside the box. And if, if I had a kid and he had a choice between us uh, spending four years of college and getting a degree in whatever communications versus go travel the world for four years like Marco Polo, I would bet my money on the kid who traveled the world for four years. Because, you know, when you, when, you, when you tell me your last name and the city you were born in, I mean, I can predict your language, your religion, your politics, half your beliefs. You're just fed all this purple Kool-Aid and you die just still drinking it. But traveling around the world, you start to realize truth. And like, like a class example, Singapore, water fluoridation mandatory, no insurance. Go across the ocean. I mean, go swim across the water a little bit. There's Tokyo with water fluoridation, uh, but government, it pays for, uh, but government insurance. So you start seeing all these cases uh, where, um, you know, you have the same um, you know, size cities and this and that, and you, you start seeing how different variables massively affect dentistry. And, right. um, you know, you go to Brazil or India, you get to see what an oversupply of dental schools does to an industry. I mean, half the dentists in uh, Brazil will never even be able to make a living from dentistry. They opened up so many schools. Well, yeah. Years ago, they had more per capita, more dentists than the United States did. Yeah, and since then, they've opened up another gazillion new schools. I mean, it's, yep. it's, it's basically half the class will graduate from dental school and just try to find employment. You had a guest recently, uh, maybe Australia, but I, or no, UK, because he was talking about direct access, that they'd recently uh, granted uh, the ability for uh, 
patients without a prescription, which I found interesting, who do they get the prescription from to see a dentist? But they don't need a prescription. They can go, the hygienists can open up their doors. Now, you know, in this country, that's, I think there's a certain amount of access permitted in, in maybe 17 states. Uh, but to me, if you're, if you're threatened by that as a dentist, don't be, because what it does is it, it can open access. It can get people more comfortable with dentistry in general. And what I would do is I would develop relationships with a hygienist because they're, they can diagnose, they can only clean teeth I and mean, they can, you know, they can do hygiene. So what a wonderful opportunity to have people out there sort of advancing the cause of dentistry, getting more people involved because they're, they're, they're removing the fear barrier. Well, you know, you know how you talk about cause, cause marketing yep. and you're into this oral systemic health. Yep. You know where I would like to uh, get the two bald brothers to get together and go to war on? Is um, um, when you look at uh, I'm not allowed by law to give a flu shot or an HPV vaccine. And when we look at the 8,000 to 38,000 senior citizens who die each year from the flu, the dental office was one of the top three last points of entry for that lady. So here's grandma coming in to get a six month cleaning, and the hygienist with a four year degree is more worried about a bleeding gum than a flu shot. I mean, what, what is most likely to kill her before her next visit? Gingivitis or the flu? And oral, then we look at it. HPV. Look at the oral pharyngeal. So I'm reading the, uh, what year is this? Oh, don't matter. But of the uh, 12,000 cases of oral pharyngeal cancer, um, 7,000 were HPV. 50% um, of penile cancer is HPV. 60% uh, of vaginal cancer is HPV. 90% of anal cancer is HPV, and all of cervical cancer is HPV. And I'm not allowed to give an HPV vaccine, but if you go to CVC or Walgreens, a farm tech can give me an HPV vaccine. How insane is that? I got eight years of, I got nine years of college, and I can't give an HPV vaccine or a flu shot, but the farm tech at Walgreens can? How are right. we supposed to differentiate ourselves as physicians of the mouth when I can't give an HPV vaccine or flu shot. And talk about cause marketing, that's maybe something we can join hands on, try to build some awareness to the American Dental Association, the AGD, whatever. Um, but anyway, I'm just rambling. Yeah, well, we could, or go direct to the public and the media. But you know, uh, I agree with you, that definitely uh, ties a hand behind our back, but it doesn't preclude us from doing uh, effective oral cancer screening. And, and how do you do an effective oral cancer screening? Well, that depends on who you talk to. You know, it's a fairly controversial subject. The uh, <laughs> various, the various uh, methods. Some some doctors say that uh, you get a lot of false positives when you use the uh, the light, you know, or the chemical uh, uh, disclosing uh, for the the, the suspect tissues. Um, uh, and a lot of dentists are afraid to do that because they don't want to be the bearer of bad news. So it's a very again, it's about communication. But the fact is that once you master the communication. That's an, or if you do screenings, you do, uh, that, be, that could be the cause that you have uh, drive your cause marketing campaigns. It blurs the distinction because now people are thinking, oh, wait, my dentist, you're not just here to, 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 to clean my teeth and fill my cavities. You're actually talking about oral cancer, which, by the way, I think, I, I don't know if I, your numbers might be old. I think the last I heard is 30,000 uh, deaths a year. From oral cancer no i was taught i said oral okay. pharyngeal cancer yeah okay so so yeah that was, i said oral pharyngeal and you said oral right. cancer and by right. the way did you know what when i was in uk uh you know the british they're a little uh how should you say it uh what's a good word to describe the british uh more uh, uh proper they quit using oral cancer because when you search on google any word that has oral in it pulls up ninety five thousand million porn sites and so they've changed it to mouth cancer because they don't want any proper British person doing a search for oral cancer and finding a pornography site. How hilarious is that? Well, they're they're they're, they're proper, all right. I guess in public. <laughs> it's gotta, that 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 energy's got to go somewhere. Oh my God! I thought that was the most fun, but yeah. So now the trend is I'm changing that from oral cancer to mouth cancer. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yep. Which has, which uh anyway. Yeah. No, okay, it's, so it's, um, you, you I was also talk different strokes, but that wouldn't be appropriate. <laughs> different strokes are different. Okay, you also talk about the mastering the art of perseverance. What, what what do you mean by that? Well, that's one of the topics I speak on. Uh, you you know about a little bit about my background, and uh, I like to think that uh, 
my experiences in the mountains, adventure racing, uh, and other endurance uh, activities has informed my, my life here you know, in civilization. And what I've done is uh, gleaned those, those uh, messages into a, a presentation I give called Master the Art of Perseverance. And what I speak on, and I show some cool video and some photos of uh, my various exploits, uh, are really six different uh, uh, distinctions or mindsets that I think if when one masters or improves, uh, has some really good implications for how they uh, they reach their summit or they you know they reach the summit of their life's expedition because I think the analogies between a, a climbing expedition and one's life are are all over the place. So is the the vocabulary is replete with references to climbing. But I talk about the importance of confidence, where it comes from. We've already touched upon the importance of having a, a sense of purpose that's not only bigger than yourself but even bigger than the team that you're with. Uh, and then speaking of that. Uh, of the importance of teamwork, the skills uh, to to let other people know that uh, because people don't care about your dreams or your vision unless you care about theirs. And literally, when you're in the mountains and if you're really a hurting cowboy, the best way I found to uh, to deal with that is to focus on somebody else's trouble and 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 get outside your head to help them. Uh, other distinctions that I've learned is that people have an unhealthy relationship with perfectionism uh, as well as failure. People in this country view perfectionism as a virtue when I believe it to be a, a vice. Uh, you can go back in history and learn that perfectionism has been behind some of the most harmful and uh, horrific ideologies in our history. And there are even some politicians today that I might say are, are practicing that, which we won't discuss right now. No, tell me. You got to tell me. You got to name them. I don't have to name them. Oh, uh, name them. It's an opinion. It's dentistry I uncensored. I think anybody that... Uh, that appeals to the, uh, the simple solutions and, and doesn't understand that the democracy is complicated. It's messy. There are no simple solutions to problems in the world or in this country. And, you know, when you've got a, people complain that the, yes, the tax code is, is, is way out of control, but if you're looking at regulation or leg proposed legislation and you complain that it's too many pages, well, that's why you got people that you trust to read it for you and give you the digest. So at least you understand what's in there. Because life is complicated. You, all right, I'll, you can't just build a wall and throw out all the illegal aliens, all right, illegal immigrants. That, that, that isn't going to work, okay? Uh, it doesn't say that anybody else has a better solution. But uh, I, I, I'm always skeptical of people that, that have simple solutions. Yeah, tax code. If it was simple, it wouldn't be fair. And if it was fair, it sure as hell ain't going to be simple. Um, hey, right. Danny, um, I'm sitting next to Ryan, which, by the way, is his one-year anniversary on this podcast. Congratulations. How cool is that? He graduated from college and thought he'd uh, help his old man with his uh, with my podcast and took it to a different level. Thank you for yeah. that, Ryan. Uh, yeah. But, hey, Danny, on those uh, videos or those other presentations, if they're YouTube or video or whatever, you could email them to Ryan, and we can attach it to the end of this If uh, uh, since you talked about it, if you want my homies to see it. Um, if be delighted to, thank you. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Send send anything you want because I, I I can tell the kids out there. And the reason I keep saying kids is all the data I see on uh, podcasts is they're all thirty and under. And I always tell people on the show if you got a question, you want a particular guest, email me Howard at dentaltown dot com. And seriously, twenty percent of the time they're in dental school, and eighty percent of the time they're under thirty. And only about once every three or four months, some guy will send me an email and say, Hey, I just want you to know there's an old fart here listen like to your show. Yeah. And, uh, that happens like every three months, but the other, uh, gazillion per day is all under 30. So we yep. really are talking to, uh, the young yep. kids. I but, also appreciate uh, you're encouraging, uh, women to get involved and to speak because they're highly underrepresented, um, you know, in this industry, in this profession. Well, I, I call them unicorns because, um, when, you know, the, the, the early women that entered the career when I was in school, um, when I, I have to ask 10 of them to be on the show before one will do it because they're, uh, I don't know, they're, they're busy, they're shy, they're what have you. But I go into dental schools, half the class of women. So I always tell the Dental Town Magazine editorial, you know, these, these half the class of women, I don't want them opening up Dental Town, seeing a bunch of old, white, bold guys. It's got to be half women. So we work our butts off trying to get women content in the magazine and women on the podcast. And uh, you, you really, like for... For white, bald males, I'm booked out on this podcast for, till what, April? How, how long are we booked out? 
April. But if any woman called me up today, I'd cancel someone like you and say, yeah, we'll do, we'll do you tomorrow. But, okay, uh, awesome. Well, I've got some people in mind, uh, some clients, some, some colleagues that I referred to who I think would, uh, would, would be only too happy to and I think would, 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 would do you proud. Well, thanks. And I appreciate you uh, um, realizing that, you know, I purposely go out of my way to find uh, other countries. Because, like, like, when we got out of school, UK had 20,000 dentists, and they were all in the NHS. And the NHS has been lowering their fees and lowering them, lowering them. Right now, a molar root canal is 100 bucks. I mean, you can't even buy the files for that kind of stuff. And it, and it had to hit rock bottom for now. 5,000 British dentists have said, the hell with that. And they're starting to go fee-for-service, doing all these things you're talking about, implants, all these things. And uh, so the world is ebbing and flowing with national insurance, PPOs, fee-for-service, cash, marketing. By the way, everything you talk about is so dangerous uh, to uh, these kids. If you're listening in Hong Kong, I have literally almost cried sometimes when somebody listened to my 30-day MBA back in the day and they did. They started doing some of the stuff I was taking then lost their license in Hong Kong or Romania or got censored in Australia. I mean, a lot of these countries um, do not believe in advertising. Uh, it's a very prevalent attitude in Africa that um, uh, a dentist or a physician advertising is extremely taboo. Um, it's true. Among some dentists to this day, it still is here. Yeah. So, uh, so a lot of it's uh, crazy. But uh, Danny, again, I can't. We went six minutes over. It's about an hour, six minutes. Um, I just want to tell you. Um, Thank you for all that you have done for dentistry. Thank you for getting me involved with Climbing to Cause 30 years ago with Lauren Levine. Um, I was with Lauren Levine before he was the digital dental guy. I was right. with him when he was a damn periodontist and uh, before he had a kid. And uh, But anyway, um, thanks for all you do. And uh, thanks for analyzing my dental website, Today's Dental, and for Dental Town because uh, my passion is Dental Town. There's 2 million dentists on earth and only 250,000 are on dental town and uh i'd like to market share buddy what's that growing. that's great market share and you know you're you're a heck of a marketer uh you've got the app which is great uh it's, it's a great packaged product and i'll do everything i can to help you get in front of more dentists for your sake and especially for their sake all right thanks because i'll tell you what i've walked in dental schools in asia in Africa where they found out I was the founder of Dental Town, which I made it all for free and all the, the poor countries, everything's free. And they literally cried. The dean is crying. I mean, this is one dean. She helped me and she cried for five minutes because she said that all of her textbooks were 20 years old and all they teach by is Dental Town. She says there's 4 million posts, there's 300 courses. We just, that's all we do is Dental Town instead of going to 20 year old textbooks. So uh, Dental Town is my mission and my purpose, my cause. But uh, Danny, again, thanks for all you do, buddy. Can't wait to see what you think of my uh, uh, today's dental website and Dental Town. It'll be my pleasure. Thank you very much, Howard. Enjoyed it. All right, buddy. Have a great Labor Day weekend. Do the same.